Tonight, I am going to continue teaching on the uh, book, The Jewel Ornament of Liberation, with commentary by uh, Trangu Rinpoche. And uh, I am on the chapter about the perfection of wisdom. And I'm going to continue where I left off uh, last week. And he is now going into uh, the section called the characteristics of each, uh, each classification. And uh, so the classifications are the wisdom awareness of the mundane a world, wisdom awareness of the lesser super mundane and wisdom awareness of the greater super mundane. And uh, actually, that was the, the section previous to this. Right now, what I'm talking about is uh, the uh, point five, which is what needs to be known, which is wisdom awareness. And uh, so we cannot go beyond suffering without understanding and experiencing this wisdom awareness. And this is talking about or going into uh, fundamental ignorance, and that is taking that which is not a self to be a self and that which is not other to be an other. So he goes into the reputation of grasping onto things as being existent. And he starts out with the non-existence of a personal self. This is a very difficult, perhaps one of the most, if not the most difficult subjects in Tibetan Buddhism, because we are very attached to uh, ourselves and we think that outer phenomena are solid and real, and also there is some kind of a, uh, a self in outer phenomena. So now the problem is, of course, that grasping on an existent personal self is the source of all problems, all suffering, this is what keeps samsara uh, spinning around and keeps us spinning around within it, life after life after life. This is the source of stress, of fear, the poisons of the mind, and all kinds of other things. Uh, it is the source of I, me, myself, mine. And so if we are going to free ourselves from the suffering of samsara, if we were going to transcend samsara, we have to see clearly the uh, misconceptions that we have made about uh, what we call a self and we need to remove those misconceptions. It's not a matter of denying what is, but it's merely a matter of acknowledging and understanding uh, that it is not, that it is a fabrication. So I went to page 381 on a, foot, on, on a footnote about personal self. And this is what the footnote said. A person is the combination of awareness and the continuity of afflicted aggregates, that being the skandhas. Believing this person to be a permanent and unique entity, we cling and become attached to it as I, and self. This is the personal self or mind. And that was a quote. 
and then I add actions and produce karma, and that produces suffering. And going back to the quote, uh, uh, quote, it is important to understand that what is being negated is a true, permanent, and ultimate existence of a self, not a relative self or personality. End quote. So Trollag Rinpoche, in the book that we had studied previously, brought up the uh, idea of a functional self. So the point being that we can have a functional self or a personal self as long as we don't see it as being permanent, as being unique, and uh, being solid, that it is going to be something that is very fluid, this uh, functional self or personal self. Uh, it is that self that um, allows us to go to the gas station and use the self-serve gas pump. I have joked in the past about if you have no self, how can you use the self-serve gas pump? And of course, the answer is that we have a functional self that allows us to do that. So it is this idea of a permanent, true, ultimate, unchanging self that needs to be eliminated. And uh, Trangu Rinpoche mentions that since it is delusion, that means that it can be eliminated. We can eliminate delusions. We can eliminate uh, habitual patterns. So uh, this is why we as Buddhists uh, look towards being able to do that. If it was solid, real, and permanent, then the only way we could get rid of it would be by denying it, and even that doesn't get rid of it. So the uh, solution is that we have to come to this conclusion through examination. And if we can, through examination, see clearly, then the whole thing falls apart. You could say, this is my example, that this idea of a permanent solid self is like a house of cards. It's actually very fragile. You pull out a card and the whole thing falls apart. And in a way, this is why there is so much stress, uh, so much um, uh, fear and all the uh, five uh, poisons of the mind that are uh, associated with this self because it is very fragile. It's not solid. It can easily be uh, uh, damaged, hurt, and so forth. And we're constantly uh, having to do, you might say, emotional maintenance to maintain it. And another point is that we are so habituated to it that we just plain can't imagine it being any other way. Uh, well, I was preparing this talk. I went back and thought of a, a, an old Beatles song. It was written by Ger George Harrison and I'm going to read a few parts of it. I am going to avoid singing it to you. I don't want to clear out the, uh, uh, the participants from this program, but it is called I, Me, Mine. And he went to India with the other Beatles and they studied under a Hindu guru. So 
Uh, this comes from no doubt the teachings that he received from his Hindu guru. Oh. <clears throat> so I, me, mine, all through the day, I, me, mine, I, me, mine, I, me, mine. All through the night, I, me, mine, I, me, mine, I, me, mine. Now they're frightened of leaving it. Everyone's weaving it, coming on strong all the time. All through the day, I, me, mine. All I can hear, I, me, mine. Even those tears, I, me, mine. No one's frightened of playing it, everyone saying it, flowing more freely than wine. All I can hear, I, me, mine. All through your life, I, me, mine. So the point is that we need to be more aware of how thoroughly habituated we are to this idea of I, me, my. So the uh, method of investigation uh, that Prangu Rinpoche talks about here is to look at the body, to start with the body. Uh, is the I in uh, your body? Uh, or is it in a part of your body? Uh, if it is in your body, where is it? And if it's in a part of your body, which part? If it's in your entire body, it, you can look at your body as being nothing but a set of parts. Uh, arms, legs, hands, fingers, toes, torso, ears, uh, head, nose, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, so if we look at our body, the body is merely a conceptual construct that is placed on this uh, collection of parts. And you can also see that even the parts are made up of smaller parts. They're made up of uh, tissue, bone, various fluids, and so forth. And even that is made up of smaller parts of molecules and atoms, subatomic particles, and so on, that there is really uh, nothing there when you start, uh, you might say, looking deeply. And uh, if it's your body and you lose a leg, uh, have you lost part of your mind? Do you lose part of your eye? So then turn your attention to your mind. Where is your mind? Can you find your mind? Is the eye in the mind? Is the eye mind? And uh, it's really difficult to find the mind because in the Buddhist uh, teachings, the mind has no true existence. And you can't find your mind if you look at it properly. Uh, and is the I your name? Well, the name was given to you by other people. Uh, is the I in your possessions, your friends, your clothing, and so forth? Um, friends come and go, clothing gets worn out and tossed away. Some clothing maybe never even gets worn. So, then uh, we ascribe I, my, and mine to other people. It's not something that is inherent in the person that we ascribe as my friend. There was a time when they weren't my friend, 
And there may come a time when they will not be my friend because things change, relationships change and so forth. So all of this is just labels and fabrications that we place on uh, ourselves and our possessions, our friends, our experience and so forth. And it is this misunderstanding that causes suffering. So he emphasizes this over and over again. And that is that we're not trying to negate an I or a self that exists. We're just trying to see clearly that what we have called I uh, is not truly existent. So he says there's two ways to meditate on no self. And one is he describes it as being reflective to uh, contemplate, to study, and so forth. And this uh, will work, but it is very, very slow. Uh, the other is the immersive approach. He uses the phrase, quote, do nothing approach, end quote. So allow yourself to be immersed in the mind's nature. that uh, remain, let's see, I'll, I'll read this whole quote here. Uh, Allow yourself to be immersed within the mind's nature, knowing that it is not a real and solid thing and you remain within this natural condition of the mind. And this is Mahamudra meditation. He's gonna be talking about Mahamudra throughout this uh, chapter here. This is one reason why this is such a difficult topic to cover is that he is going over uh, via very, very, very briefly a subject that uh, uh, books and books and books and books have been written about. And uh, to practice Mahamudra properly, you need to have a close instruction uh, with uh, a, a teacher who has uh, practiced and realized Mahamudra uh, meditation. You don't get this out of books or even from a talk. So to continue from there, uh, the next step is to look at the non-existence of uh, the self of phenomena that we start with uh, trying to work on uh, understanding that we have no self. And now we go to understanding that a phenomena has no self. So uh, what this means is that we have the mistaken idea that things are truly existent in a real and substantial way. Or on page 276, he says, the belief in the existence of a self entity of phenomena. So we need to understand this too, because again, this causes suffering, this mistaken belief causes suffering. If we do not um, understand this thoroughly and completely, that the very best that we can do to eliminate suffering is uh, remove the suffering temporarily for a short time. He likens it to cutting off a leaf of a plant or maybe even the stem of the plant, but leaving the roots there. So if you can understand, if you come to the realization that outer objects are not real, 
then the suffering associated with outer objects be, is eliminated because you realize that that is not real either. So if you realize outer objects are not real, then any suffering that uh, difficulties and so forth that they create for you, you realize that that isn't real either. And this way suffering can be eliminated. Whereas the samsaric approach is, of course, is that this suffering is real and I have to eliminate whoever it is or whatever it is that's causing this uh, suffering. Here we work with our mind, which is much easier to work with than the entire uh, uh, planet and all beings on it that sometimes seem like every last one of them is against us, trying to cause us suffering of one kind or another. So um, the uh, emptiness of phenomena is divided into two groups. Uh, outer phenomena and uh, inner phenomena. He starts out with going into the emptiness of outer phenomena. So you begin by contemplating an outer object. And we think that this outer object is real. We see it, we touch it, we can eat it. Perhaps sometimes I just ate supper, so. I ate an outer object. But if we look uh, closely, now he uses the example of a hand, that a hand is made of parts and the parts are made of parts. Uh, our hand is dependent on its parts for existence. It has no true independent existence. So being uh, naturally devoid of its own existence, it is called empty. So you can see the hand, but since it is uh, interdependent with my arm and the rest of my body, and then the whole world, uh, the food, the hand did not provide the food that I ate. It may have served as a, uh, source of delivering the food to my mouth, but um, it is, quote, naturally devoid of its own existence. And that is a definition of em uh, emptiness. So the hand is just a label for a collection of parts. Uh, if the hand were true, it doesn't change. What is true in Buddhism is permanent. What changes is impermanent and is not true. It is merely uh, a passing phenomena. So then he goes into a, uh, a very interesting logical uh, argument here. Uh, he says that uh, uh, things don't have to be real in order uh, for them to manifest to us. That uh, they are manifestations of our own mind. And he uses this classic example of a dream that when we dream, we see projections of our mind in the dream and they seem very real we, you might say, totally buy into and believe the dream in most cases. And so this is what he is talking about, that our hand may seem to be very real, but it is a bit like a manifestation of a dream. And now there are uh, lots of different uh, exercises and meditation in Mahamudra to help you understand this. All I'm doing here, all Trangu Rinpoche is doing in the book is kind of introducing these ideas. But um, uh, there are meditations on the emptiness of outer objects. 
there are examinations, guided examinations, and uh, so on and so forth. And then, as was mentioned earlier, there is, uh, as you become uh, more and more adept at uh, Mahamudra practices, you can rest your mind in the, its own essence. Just letting yourself be resting in the very essence of mind. So that is how it covers the emptiness of outer objects. Now is the emptiness of inner mind. So the mind that receives uh, these outer objects, the input from our five senses, is considered to be empty and unreal. And so there are three examinations that he goes into to uh, help determine this. Uh, is the mind empty and unreal? The first one was, is labeled, uh, the mind does not exist when examined through a momentariness. So the mind is a flow, a stream. Uh, it's not a solid thing. It's a, a succession of incidents, one moment after another, after another, after another. And so he talks about looking at one instant, but already here we're stuck with the uh, logic of uh, the instant is a concept, it's a projection. The instant is in our mind, that term. And uh, the mind is changing. Uh, the mind is undergoing a constant uh, change of different experiences, different thoughts, emotional states, and uh, so forth. So the mind is, there's nothing that is permanent there. It is the experiencer. And what is experienced is not real and it's uh, constantly changing. So the, uh, the uh, next analysis is mind does not exist since it has not been seen by anyone. So here, this examination is where does the mind come from? Where does it go? Where does it abide? Uh, when does it stop? Where does it stop? And so forth. And uh, so it's good actually to do these examinations from time to time. Where is my mind? Has it gone anywhere? And so forth. Where do thoughts come from? Where do thoughts go? Where do they abide? And uh, he kind of ends this analysis by saying that no one has ever found it. But if you want to look for it, go right ahead and uh, uh, let me know. If you find it, I'll uh, make sure I can forward this to Krangu Rinpoche. So he then um, quotes from the... Uh, Kajyapa requested sutra, which kind of um, backs up what he has just said, and I'm not going to read it, but uh, basically the, uh, the sutra says that upon examination, the mind cannot be found and will never be found. And the third is, the third examination is, since there are no objects, no mind exists. So the logic is if uh, the object isn't real then the perceiving mind can't be real either. If these outer objects aren't real, then how can the mind be real? 
and uh, this is a very simplified version of this argument. I would be personally a little curious to uh, hear more about it, uh, but uh, very simply, if outer objects aren't real and the mind can perceive outer objects, then can how can the mind be real? Or in another way of putting it, if the mind is real, can a real mind perceive unreal things? I once listened to a cassette tape of a Rinpoche talking, and this was way back in the 80s. And uh, the translator was an American and uh, somebody asked a question and he got into Buddhist logic. And the translator said to the questioner, watch out when you get into Buddhist logic, you'll get completely lost. And uh, it can be, let's just say they spend a lot of time on logic, logical arguments and so forth. So um, then uh, comes to another uh, line of reasoning, and this is the refutation of grasping to things as being non-existent. And uh, so he says, what does emptiness means? What does emptiness mean? Uh, it's not void. It's not like the, uh, um, the horns of a rabbit, which of course have never existed. So emptiness is not like that. It's not that type of uh, non-existence. And it's not empty like space. That this emptiness that uh, we are talking about here in the perfection of wisdom, is uh, it possesses clarity and also it is potential. Anything can manifest within emptiness. Uh, Trangu Rinpoche uses this phrase, quote, the very expression, the nature of phenomena He doesn't mention this, but there is a term used in uh, Buddhism called the, uh, uh, the Dharma Dhatu, and it is translated as the sphere of phenomena. And uh, this is where all phenomena arise. This is where all sentient beings arise and dwell in, and phenomena arises and dwells in, and so forth. This is a good way to look at emptiness, the sphere of phenomena. It is potential, it is possibility, it is what allows things to manifest. So uh, while things are empty and have no true existence, appearances arise through interdependence. The next is the path that leads to liberation. This was in my uh, text, it had a C on it. Uh, so the only activity necessary to eliminate suffering is to understand that a suffering is empty and non-existent. That with this proper understanding, you don't have to suppress suffering. You don't even have to eliminate negative thoughts. Uh, all the uh, negative act factors of mind are eliminated just by this understanding of emptiness. And uh, at first, the understanding is not an all or nothing situation. You get glimpses of it, it's unstable. But as you practice more and more, 
and it, the experience becomes more stable, then more and more negativity is purified and eliminated because you realize that it is uh, uh, empty of inherent existence. The questioner started out by saying that uh, when you began, you talked about how all pervasive this uh, grasping at an I, a me, my, and so forth is. And so the question is, is there an other than, I'm uh, re thinking that uh, she meant that if we let go of this uh, clinging to this I, which is uh, actually a fabrication, is there another then that would replace it? And I may have misunderstood the question, but I'm going to say that what happens actually is we are liberated because we don't have these constraints. Uh, we don't have this, e this uh, very sensitive ego that we have to protect and take care of and nourish and so on and so forth. And we're overcome with, um, uh, well, uh, um, bliss, uh, wisdom, uh, incredible love and compassion. And um, there is this functional self that I talked about that allows you to uh, drive a car down the road and follow the rules and uh, fill up the gas tank and so forth. But it's actually quite liberating and uh, uh, you become more oriented towards uh, what you can do to help other beings. Yes, well, a, uh, one of the uh, participants mentioned that this is really helpful because uh, the message that I'm getting is that I don't have to take myself so seriously. And I find that this allows me to uh, uh, lighten up and even laugh instead of uh, getting all uh, tense and stressed out and so forth when uh, things happen. And it's a very good observation that, uh, that is true, that we uh, get so um, uptight about uh, our ego and what could possibly damage it and when people you might say, uh, even look the wrong way at us. Uh, we can make a big deal out of it. And we just make big deals out of little things. Uh, there's the analogy, I don't know where it comes from, tempest in the teapot or a teacup. Uh, and uh, yeah, with a little perspective, uh, life just goes a lot easier. The uh, questioner said it's a lot, uh, laughs a lot, and uh, laughing is very, very helpful. Well, the question was about, well, we've got this um, uh, very advanced Mahamudra practice that is being presented here, but then we have the Eightfold Path, and we have this practice and that practice, and... Um, what I got out of the question is, is how do they all fit in? The, um, it's progressive. You start with the easy things first. You start with self-discipline, understanding the uh, 10 virtuous and uh, 10 non-virtuous actions. And then you add to that the bodhisattva uh, motivation of wanting to progress on the path so you can benefit uh, all beings and so forth. But uh, the, uh, the culmination is uh, Vajrayana uh, and Mahamudra. That uh, you need a base, you might say, to build on a foundation, a good foundation but the Mahamudra meditation and practices uh, are the, uh, you might say the crown jewel of the Kagyu lineage. 
In the Nyingma, it is uh, Zogchen. And uh, these practices are very, very powerful and they lead to realization more quickly. It also requires a, an advanced student. It requires a much closer relationship with the teacher because they are so powerful it's uh, easy to go in the wrong direction. And instead of traveling quickly on the path uh, to uh, travel quickly in the wrong direction. Rinpoche once explained it this way that, uh, so we have this jewel of mind, Buddha mind, that we're trying to uh, dig out out of the ground. And so with, with the Hinayana, which is self-discipline and working with our own kleshas, uh, it's, uh, we've got our uh, body, our fingers and our fingernails, and we can dig in the ground to get this dirt, dirty uh, uh, jewel and bring it up and clean it off. With um, Mahayana, this would include the... Uh, seven points of mind training, Lojong, for instance. And uh, with that, we have a pick and a shovel. So we can dig much quicker, get to that jewel. With Vajrayana, we have a, um, this was his analogy. We have dynamite and a bulldozer. And uh, the problem is, is these are dangerous to work with. Uh, that, uh, uh, and so it requires a lot closer uh, uh, working relationship with a, a good qualified teacher with uh, Vajrayana and Mahamudra.